I'm Scott Allen Miller, and this is my everyday life living in Nicaragua. Today, I am super busy. I am attending a funeral, and we're skipping the live stream today. So I have to shuffle things around, and I'm trying really hard to start catching up a little bit on the videos, because I've been publishing same day and just falling you know, but not far, farther and farther behind, but I'm running right at as late as we can get. So I'm working to catch up a little bit. So for today's video, one, we're holding off the live stream, but we are hoping to do that tomorrow. So if you are hoping to see it today, try to make it tomorrow. And if you can't make it on Thursdays, but can on Fridays, this is your opportunity. I hope I'll let you guys know tomorrow how that goes. But um, we have a, a funeral for a dear friend um, and attended last night and is still going today. So that is what's going on for us. So for today's video, I'm doing something a little bit different, but I think you guys enjoy when I do this. It's just super infrequent. And I'm going through a video from another channel and giving you guys a breakdown of what this information has and what's correct or incorrect or a little bit of uh, insight uh, onto this because it is a relatively popular video, 1400 views at the time that I am posting this on what I've learned in Nicaragua in 2023. It was a live stream on everything Nicaragua. And it's Place in time is kind of interesting, um, so I think I yeah, I haven't even watched it yet, right? So I'm I'm sure there's going to be stuff to talk about. So I wanted to dig into it and thought it'd be a great opportunity to do a video here at my desk uh, before I head out uh, to the funeral. So let's get to that right after the bump. This is going to be a completely different format than we normally do, but we need to shake things up, right? It's interesting. And let me guys, let me, let me guys, let me know guys down in those comments, what you want to see questions that you have. If you have video questions, please send them in all the instructions on how to do that are on every video. I love being able to put you guys in the videos. It makes a huge difference. Um, but for this one, like this is so different. I do want a lot of feedback. Like, is this fun to do? Is it frustrating? Is it cool? Whatever. Uh, let me know. And uh, of course, you can buy me a coffee if you want to support this channel. And we have our membership with that join button down there now. Okay, let's get to the beginning of this video, which will be linked in the show notes, of course, should you want to watch it. But I'm not saying you need to because it just supports uh, this kind of content, which isn't always that accurate. You definitely want accurate information from this kind of thing. All right, at a minute and 16, Tony mentions that he went to the paid private clinic. Sorry, I have this on because I'm listening to the video when I'm not talking to you. And he went to the paid private clinic in San Juan del Sur. That's where he's based. And um, to see the doctor, he had pneumonia, so he was just getting um, a consult and medicine or whatever. That cost him $20. So this is really interesting because this is a year ago. If you were to do the same thing today in Leon, I know that the price is $10 plus like tax. So it's like $10.50. Uh, now, if you go to the ER, it's more like $15 but you don't need the ER if you have pneumonia under normal circumstances. If you do, you should have gone earlier. But if you're just going in because you need to get seen by a doctor in medicine, $10 is all you pay. So that's just a handy number to have. Now he mentions there's a free clinic in San Juan del Sur and they're perfectly fine. We have a free clinic here in Leon. I don't, I don't think I would recommend going there. Jimmy actually went there last night and we're like, oh, Jimmy, I can't believe that they took you there. It's the old one being replaced by the new hospital. It's not the best. It's like the worst clinic in the country. That's one of the reasons we're getting the best clinic in the country. So really soon, like weeks, we're going to have the most amazing public facility that you've ever seen in Nicaragua. It's going to be fantastic. So he's one of the absolute last. For all we know, he's going to be the last expat to ever go to the old public hospital. Like that's everyone goes to a MOXA, the private facility here, and pays the $10. So Tony had never done that before, and it was his one time $20. So it's just worth noting that between San Juan and Leon, the private clinics have a 100% difference in price. Still super cheap, completely accessible. And of course, things in San Juan del Sur are going to cost more. But I know my audience is always like, what is, where do you get these price differences when living in one place and the other? Because like, you know, my housing isn't that much different or my food, like I can hunt around for food. And it's a lot of these little things and things that when you live in both places, you'll realize quickly, like the Top end restaurants in San Juan del Sur may cost you $40 for a meal, and that same meal at a top end restaurant in Leon may cost you $25. Well, then you say, well, but I can eat frugally in both, and you absolutely can. But the cheapest meal you might be able to get in San Juan is $2, and that may be $0.80 cents in Leon. Each 
each equivalent tier is cheaper in Leon. Some are close, some are wildly different, so they, it depends on what exactly you're looking for. But basically everything in Leon is cheaper than anything in Managua or uh, San Juan del Sur or Granada, places like that. Leon is essentially the cheapest place in the country for I don't know why, but it really is uh, low cost even compared to the rest of Nicaragua, which is very low cost, but it's an interesting uh, comparison in the pricing of things that we know. Um, but the, his is $20 a year ago. That easily could be $22, $24 now. Um, just guessing here, $10 is like last week. Just before the six minute point, Tony mentions that riding a motorcycle, getting wet and being cold. First of all, if you get wet in Nicaragua, you're not very likely to actually be cold, but okay, let's just imagine. Uh, if that were to happen, he says, oh, that's a great way to get pneumonia to tie it into his pneumonia story. Now, most of my viewers are living in the 21st century, so I just wanna mention this is an old wives tale. This is one of those things that people who come from science-based educations often point to specifically as one of those areas where where people who don't understand modern medicine or just basic science and biology still repeat these uh, these these wives tales, old wives tales from long ago. When I was a small child, we already knew that pneumonia was not caused, nothing is caused by getting cold. Hypothermia, sure, but your body does not have a lowered immune response when it's cold, especially briefly, and you're not really cold, you're just shivering. In no way whatsoever does that contribute to being unhealthy. In fact, it may do the opposite. It's actually kind of good for you, but certainly not something I'd say go out and do that for that reason. But the getting wet, getting cold, none of that contributes to pneumonia. The thing that makes people correlate that incorrectly is that you tend to get wet and cold in the seasons where you tend to stay in and cuddle by warmers, whether it's a fire or a heater or whatever, and people tend to breathe the same air, touch the same things because they're physically proximate to each other. Uh, so that's why we have colds and pneumonia in the winter season. It's because people are physically closer in the summer, people spread out. And so pneumonia and things like that, that are airborne illnesses are not nearly as likely to spread when everyone's like, dude, I'm warm, get away from me. Like, like it's just a different thing. So this is just wanted to point this out because when you live in Nicaragua, there are a lot of non-science-based medical myths that still swirl around. A lot of people believe you can't have your windows open at night. These things actually contribute to health problems, minor ones generally, but they, you know, fresh air is well known to be one of the most important things for health. Sunlight, one of the best things for health. So you don't want to be avoiding those things because you're believing in witchcraft, right? And that's, that's kind of what this is. Now, he's talking about buying cars. Uh, so there's some information here. Um, there's a bunch of things to unpack in the things that he says, because sometimes he's hidden things in there. One is that he's been in Nicaragua four years, no residency, no hope at residency, no path to residency, and just doing border runs. So people ask me all the time, how long can you do this? Now, I've never heard of anyone being able to go for four years without getting into some kind of trouble, uh, not trouble, but getting it mentioned to them that they need to have a path towards uh, residency. Uh, you may go over four years, but normally it's because a residency process is already underway. Now, we say you can come down and stay a long time without starting residency. Yes, absolutely. Four years is generally quite a bit longer than that. I don't know why he was given four years of doing that system. Um, this is a year ago, so that would be people who are on five years today if they were still doing it. Um, of course, policies change over time. There was a time where you could easily do it for a long time, and there was a time period not that long ago, so it may have affected him, where there was a problem with the residency processing on Nicaragua's side, and because they didn't want to screw anyone over, uh, as a means of dealing with that, what they did was um, simply suspend anyone, basically the suspension of the border run system was suspended. Does that make sense? They suspended the suspension. So normally there'd be a limit to how long you can keep going and doing border runs. They got rid of that temporarily until they fixed the system internally. Very nice, perfect way to deal with it. Everyone was happy. Maybe he fell into that and that created some of the amount of time that he got um, that, uh, that other people would not normally but it's worth noting that this is a this is an example if he's if he's being accurate that four years doing border runs um, is the longest I've heard from someone with no mitigating factors. Um, but I don't know why what his mitigating factors might have been. Maybe he had some, um, and uh, it's worth noting that this is not normal. Don't expect to be given that long. Uh, you would at least have to be in a conversation under normal circumstances to discuss how you would become a resident or that your temporary status was about to come to an end. And it's like, it's only six more months. Can you just waive things for another six months so that I can get through, right? Like, okay, they're reasonable, right? Have a conversation, be honest, uh, work with them, and you're probably going to be fine. Now, he talks about getting a car. That was like 
mixed into is getting a car thing. One of the things that he said is the simple gringo process, and lots of gringos do this, is put just buy a car for someone else and drive someone else's car. And this is the system we, we warn people about. Like, that's so one, just so dumb. And it's so, like, not a good idea. And it's so just obvious that you could buy someone else like if you were moving to the u.s and the u.s said you're not allowed to buy a car and you said well i'm just gonna buy my buddy a car and i'll drive that car and like i'm sneaking around you're not sneaking around you bought your buddy a car you're totally allowed to do that you're taking all the risks you bought him a car he wants to sell it you can't say anything he wants to drive it you can't say anything now you have some risks what if you have an accident what if you commit a crime with that car you're putting him at risk so in general Nicaraguans would be crazy to do this for you, but many are desperate for money, and so a lot of gringos take advantage of that and put them at risk and 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 do this system and, and rely on them to be honest and, and the gringos not to have accidents or not to do something illegal. Generally, they don't. And, uh, and everyone can work out, but it is an insanely risky system and it makes absolutely no sense, which he alludes to, right? So I'm not saying he says to do this, but he mentions it, I think, too casually. It should be one, probably not mentioned. There's no reason to ever mention it because it's not a path to you owning a car. It's a path to someone else owning a car that you can drive. You can come up with anything where you rent a car from someone, right? Hey, man, can I borrow your car? No, I like my car. Okay, what if I buy you an extra car? Can I, can I drive that? Sure, I'm down with that, right? Everybody's going to be okay with that. Bait. Like, okay, but you don't need to mention that, right? Like, Because that does not solve the desire to own a car in any way, nor is it smart. It's just horrible. Okay, but then he mentions that you can't have a car as a resident. Now, this is not 100% true. Some residents, or, I'm sorry, as a tourist, as a, as a uh, gringo living in the country, he says you can't have a car. That is not true at all. If you have residency, you can absolutely buy a car. That's just done, right? It's the magic of residency, you can buy a car or import a car. Either one, done, completely allowed to. It's not like you have to get permission, you don't have to ask anybody, it's just that's something you get to do, easy peasy. If you don't have your residency, there are situations where you might be able to get a car. It has happened. So you just have to go through more paperwork, more effort, talk to the right people. Uh, maybe you have to pay extra, maybe you have to file more stuff, but it does exist as an option. I do not know the details on that. I do not need to do that. I never want Wanted to do that. I don't really know anyone who has um, to the point where they're willing to like go through any effort for it because there's other ways to get a car and most people have residency coming at some point if they're in a position of wanting to own a car. So he then mentions, and this totally makes sense, is what you can do is open an essay. That's a, an anonymous society, which is the same as a Corp C, a Class C corporation in the United States. He mentions LLC. That is not what it is. It is a full corporation with stocks. Uh, and but it, those are not that dissimilar, but they are slightly different. It is, like, it is the top level, full-blown incorporation. Many... Many places in like the United States, LLC, while it says corporation in the name, many places don't consider that incorporation. That's not really accurate. It is incorporation, but it's marginal incorporation. Whereas when people say I have a corporation, they mean a class C like an essay. So he mentions you can own, uh, open an essay, you know, start up a, an official business on paper and that business that you own can own a car. That is absolutely true and that is generally what we recommend. It's not a big deal to have an essay and having one gives you a lot of flexibility for other things you may want to do if you're going to be living here long term. If this is your home, having an essay to handle things for you can make a lot of sense. So that can be a great path to go, especially if you plan to put off your residency for quite a long time or need to for some reason. Or if you're an investor or you're attempting to get residency through investment, that investment has to go through an essay. So you might as well, because you have to start the essay before you can apply for residency, you have to do a number of steps. And one of the earliest ones can be buying a car. So it totally makes sense. Now, something he mentions in here is that if you watch people make an essay, you can learn how to do it, like hire a lawyer to do it, right? And you can watch how they do it, and then you can do it cheaper on your own in the future. In theory, that's a great idea. Like learning the processes for things, totally smart. That's a great mindset. 
The problem is, is in Nicaragua, you're allowed to own one essay. Owning two is considered a form of fraud. It's kind of like money laundering. It's just hiding your activities from the government. You have a lot of protection so that, uh, and, and there's a reason why this mindset exists. In the U.S. and Canada, we have the mindset, the, the, the legal framework is designed around opening companies for every little thing that you want to keep discreet, and then you track each of the companies individually. And that's just the way things work. It's not wrong. It's not cheating the system. It is how it is designed to work. So if you're starting a restaurant, you start a business that owns the restaurant. You want to get into property management, you open a company that does property management. Maybe you have a holding company that holds those companies, but you segment things by company. And it allows you to sell those companies without selling things that own them or that they own, all kinds of things. So there's lots of logic to the system. And as an American, this is totally normal. It's just how our brains work. When you come to Nicaragua, there was a time where things worked that way, but it's been some time. And here now they've switched to a single incorporation system. So if you're an investor, you get one company. You can own that company. That company can do a lot of different activities and it can have a lot of protections inside the company. So the thing is in the U.S., there's very little protection inside a company. If, a co if one division of a company does something wrong, it can bleed over and hurt other divisions. You have a division that does housing and they get in trouble for not maintaining fire code. That can go after your division that makes video games. They have nothing to do with it, but they're part of the same company, so they're exposed. In Nicaragua, you're able to have protections inside a single company. In the U.S., you would simply break those into two separate companies and protect them that way. It's two different ways to skin the cat. It's not that one is good and bad or right or wrong. It is just two very different approaches. But what Tony is mentioning here is an American or Canadian mindset and thinking, oh, if I know how to do this once, I can do it lots of other times. But legally, you can't do that in Nicaragua. So while it's useful to learn how to do that, if you want to open another essay, you must completely shut down your old one and then open up a new one. And I have friends who watch the show who own lots of essay essays from the time where that was allowed and the normal thing to do. There's a lot of old remnants of American uh, mindset and a lot of business stuff here in Nicaragua because there was a lot of overlap in time where the U.S. was was in charge of those things. Uh, and so they're in the process of winding that stuff down. They have to clean it all up to be able to do things because they want you to make those things go away, which is a kind of a pain in the butt, but it's a thing you got to do. So yes, getting an essay to own a car, totally an option, but he leaves out the obvious choices of just get your residency and get a car or find a way to get a car without residency or an essay. But yes, having an essay to get a car can be totally logical if that meets your needs. So it, it's, it's not bad advice. He just has these nuances in there that, um, you know, <laughs> being in Nicaragua for four years, you would think that some of these things would be second nature for him, um, but uh, clearly there's a lot that he's kind of, um, and, and, and this is a risk, right? This is one of the things that we said recently about people in San Juan del Sur, and I know some people in San Juan del Sur are, you know, doing great and, and, and interested in everything and researching and watching this channel, and there's exceptions, but there's so many people in San Juan del Sur who get into their bubble and never learn about Nicaragua, never talk to anybody, never have any exposure, never really learn how things work, and so you'll find people who've been here for three, four years and are what in the rest of the country, we think of as people with the experience of three to six months, maybe nine months. They're completely surprised by really basic things that we deal with every day, everywhere else in the country. And, uh, you know, that bubble, while it can be nice, you know, you've got your little isolation from things and you're, you know, living your own uh, kind of culture that, that may be a perfect mix for you. Being isolated from the culture that governs the place that you're in carries risks, right? In this case, it's not really risk for Tony. It's just, it's just, these are gaps in his knowledge. And he's making a channel where he's trying to explain things. Um, and, and, and I have the same problem, right? So there's gaps in my knowledge and I'm doing my best to get that information out to you and verify things. Uh, but there's going to be gaps, but definitely the degree of gaps is, is a bit different. So, uh, these are, um, and I've only been here three years, well, three and a half, right? Um, but at three and a half years, a lot of this stuff is things that we knew, right away, right? These were early things um, that you that you discover by just going through these processes or dealing with stuff, trying to get a car or whatever. Uh, so it's just worth noting that there, there are paths to those things that most people are aware of. That he doesn't know about residency for having a car is pretty surprising, but everyone has their gaps. Now, just real quick, I need to point out that he mentions the Genesis bikes. He calls them Hennessy's or Genesis, like its name is Genesis, like straight up. And he mentions that there's a lot of these bikes that don't last very long because they're cheap Chinese made. And so this is something to watch out for. Uh, I've only noticed this in the expat communities, but there is an unbelievable anti-Chinese push um, from people and just this fear of China that, that is pervasive. And anytime they see something they don't know, they say this Chinese thing and it's, it's cheap and it's junk and blah, blah, blah. So 
One, why he would call it the Hennessy's, it's clearly named Genesis. Like, don't be weird about it. Um, two, most of the bikes that people associate with being made in China here are actually made in India. Hero, which is the big brand here that you see everywhere, is Indian, not Chinese. But everyone will tell you it's Chinese because they're conditioned to repeat that everything that's cheap is Chinese. And by P they, I mean expats. The locals know that it's from India. Uh, they have Indian-based trucks as well. But worth noting, Genesis is neither made in India nor China. It is a British bike company owned by a British private equity firm, H. Young Group. So that is 100% British, so it's fine. Maybe it's junk. I'm not, not telling you to go get a Genesis. I'm just telling you that the word is Genesis, and it's a completely British company, and don't fall for everybody mentioning China for everything. Yes, the Chinese stores that have the Mandarin written on everything, those are generally Chinese businesses. But outside of that, every time someone tells you something's Chinese, assume they're making it up, or they're just repeating something that they didn't think through critically, because it's about nine out of 10 times that I'm told something is Chinese when you look into it that you find out that it actually is. It's become just the go-to, it's like the word gringo. Chinese has become the word gringo to gringos in Nicaragua. And then, oh my gosh, here's where he goes completely off the rails. So at about nine minutes, he starts talking about, he thought Nicaragua was going to be cheap. Now keep in mind, Canada is the most expensive cost of living uh, compared to income in the Western Hemisphere, and Nicaragua is the cheapest. And he then says, I thought Nicaragua would be cheap, but it's not. It costs just as much as Canada. Now, the degree to which this is insane and dishonest cannot be overstated. There's no way to make a statement like this and have any sincerity behind it. Now, he depends on this because he had the Radpad business that was priced way above market and was, you know, trying to justify why his products cost uh, at a rate that made absolutely no sense uh, in Nicaragua when everyone who's here knows how cheap things are. This is obviously a video made for people who are not here and don't have a way to check things and are going to fall for the scam. So we need to be um, cognizant that there, he does have a business that depends on specifically uh, misleading people as to this very specific issue, right? That his entire business model was built around making the claim that these tiny rad pads that are made out of you know, materials that are not likely to hold up well near the beaches because the salt water air just destroys anything with metal in it. Uh, there's reasons that materials that we have here are used. Um, and he then talks about, he, do, he mixes a bunch of concepts to try to give you a smoke and mirrors thing here, but I want to break a few of these down real quickly. One, he says, houses are so expensive here. Just like, you know, yeah, obviously they're built with stronger materials than in, than in the north because wood just doesn't hold up here. He's right about that. So yes, there's better construction here. Like your houses are expected to last hundreds of years without regular maintenance. Yeah, great. But uh, as long as you keep the jungle from overtaking them. We talk about this all the time. The standard Nicaraguan houses vary between 16,000. This is today's prices, 16,000 to 35,000. And he's talking about how there's no such house existing in the country, but it's the standard house that they build in every community everywhere. So trying to claim that Nicaragua's entire housing market doesn't exist is quite literally insane. And I say that a lot, but it is. You have to be out of your mind. How could those words come out of his mouth? He's been here for over five minutes. He can't ever have thought that that was not the case. He then says, you know, oh, lots are so expensive. He's basically repeating every scammer from San Juan del Sur who's trying to quickly make a buck by turning a bad investment on an unsuspecting expat. He just, his entire thing for 10 minutes is just that, lying through his teeth about the cost of everything. And including... In the midst of this, he mentions that after four years, he's 100% in on Nicaragua. This is the one place he wants to be. And he also mentions that the cost of getting home, now I realize he's from Canada, not the US, is so expensive that he can never go. Now, on, on one side, he's been here for a long time. So if you know anything about the housing market, you know that he should be saving hundreds of dollars every month, right? At a minimum, you should be saving, I don't know, maybe five or $600 a month. And in a more common scenario, you're probably saving in excess of a thousand. That's every single month just in your housing. Then you're likely, now if you were living with family in the US and or Canada and you, you know, you didn't pay rent, uh, obviously that's a little bit different, but you can easily rent places for a few hundred dollars all over Nicaragua. Beautiful places, safe places, big places, right? Three bedroom houses and gated communities, 350 in really desirable spots. So 
Where are you going to do that in Canada? Even though Canada does have some nice spots with nice houses, you can't rent them for $350. That's absurd. Even in really undesirable areas, you can't do that. But here you can do it in the cities. And that's going to nice, modern, American and Canadian style houses. If you're willing to go to Nicaraguan style houses, knock $100 off of that just as a starting point, $200 off on extreme cases. Uh, so this is just completely different numbers. What he's talking about only makes sense to someone who's done, one, never been to Nicaragua, and two, never researched it at all, or thought critically about it. Just thinking about Nicaragua should be enough to make people say, this can't be accurate, this makes no sense. How can Nicaraguans with an average income one fortieth that of the United States have housing prices similar to Canada. That doesn't make any sense. Obviously, that's not true. Let's just, yeah, it crazy. So that's the first thing. Things are cheap in Nicaragua. They're cheap all over Nicaragua. And you have to go out of your way and be a complete idiot unless you want to spend money. That's fine, right? Oh, I found this really beautiful spot. It's really expensive and I have the money. I don't care. Great. But if you're trying to be frugal, and he's talking about how he cannot visit his family because he can't save up money because he has, he, he spends, you know, it's so expensive to live in Nicaragua, even though he has to be able to save more than the cost of traveling to Canada every single month, just in his housing, then his food cheaper as well by a lot. Any Canadian who's been to Nicaragua will tell you, oh yeah, much cheaper. And then there's the other things, the, you know, the, the transportation, all those things. He also tries to sell that everybody needs a Toyota Hilux. Now, nothing wrong with the Toyota Hilux. It's a really nice truck. It does give you a reputation of being pretentious. All the people who are annoying here drive Hiluxes, but they are a practical vehicle. I kind of want one myself. But one, you certainly don't need a Hilux. That's Again, absurd. That's his recommendation. We talked about that in another video. He doubled down on that, right? You gotta buy this super expensive vehicle. Well, no wonder everything is gonna be expensive to him. Every time he talks, he has this you must do thing that I don't know anyone who has to do. I know like zero expats who have a Hilux and none of us need one. <clears throat> We'd all love an extra vehicle. Like someone wants to give us one. Of course, I'd like to have a Hilux. Cool, but none of us are spending money on it because it's completely impractical and none of us have a reason to have one. So why does he feel that every single expat needs a Hilux when we say the average expat probably shouldn't even have a car? A lot should have cars, no reason not to have one, and a Hilux is a reasonable vehicle. If you want to have a big vehicle and you want the high clearance and you want to be able to go off-roading and you don't mind the, the higher gas prices, great. It's a perfectly viable vehicle and they sell them in country everywhere. You see tons. So that's fine. But he's creating false cost left and right to try to make the country seem somehow more expensive. But even when you look at the things he mentions, it's still half a third the price of living in the US or Canada. So it doesn't make any sense. But he then says that he's completely in on Nicaragua. He's been here for four years. He's all in. He's never leaving. This is he's dedicated to this spot. This video came out on December 24th. On November 23rd, I believe it is, he had made the video that we talked about. The reason that I first saw his material was when it was brought to my attention. Now, I got it a few weeks later that he had made a video ripping into Nicaragua and basic, basically complaining that Nicaraguans expect to be paid, um, that, that he's expected to pay taxes. He was complaining that people were expected to be paid their salary. He was upset that there were just costs involved with having employees, that extorting employees didn't go over well, that committing crimes wasn't appreciated. Like it was really crazy and really crazy to have made a video bragging or whining about basically being a criminal and taking and attempting to take advantage of the most uh, vulnerable, right? And we talked about this on that video, but this is just weeks after that. So he, he made this video where he just ripped into Nicaragua being basically an entitled gringo and saying that basically minimum wage Nicaraguan workers owed it to him to work for free. And he even made the claim that since his business wasn't profitable, which flies in the face of the things he says about Radpad, that he shouldn't have to pay the workers. They should pay for his failures. That it's something that he should be able to take from them. It was the most horrific thing. It was so evil in that video. And so we, someone sent it to me and it's like, can you like look at this and comment on this? So this is just weeks after that. Now we posted about two months after this, um, that video breaking down what he had said in that video. And some of it, he tries to couch as woe is me 
And if you're watching it casually, it's easy to not notice the things that he's saying uh, because he makes claims like, well, my lawyer said, and obviously either he didn't have a lawyer or his lawyer was lying. Most likely he doesn't have an actual lawyer because it doesn't take a very much trained lawyer to know that he had just advised him to commit crimes and ones that will definitely get you deported. Like if you start stealing from Nicaraguans, like this isn't the US where employers are allowed to just steal, right? I just watched this really great TikTok the other day where someone broke down that crime is a social construct because if you are a starving worker and you steal $100 from a grocery store to pay for food, uh, you will go to jail, which you shouldn't do, right? You shouldn't steal $100 from, from a grocery store. So, okay, great. But if your employer steals, steals $100 from you, you can't send them to jail. You have almost no means of getting that $100 back, even though it's your money and they stole it from you. So there's this disparity where companies can steal from you with basic impunity. Sometimes they get in trouble, sometimes they get fined, but most of the time they just get away with it. Never do they go to jail. And if you, as the worker who's been stolen from tries to feed your family to make up for a shortfall in the legal system, you go to jail if you get caught. It's horrible. And basically he's trying to treat Nicaragua like that as if it has this deep-seated corruption like North America does, but it does not. Stealing from minimum wage workers who you're stealing from the tax system goes over incredibly poorly, and it's like he had no idea that he was a guest here. Technically, according to this video, he's a tourist. He's not even a resident. He has no paperwork whatsoever. He's doing border runs, which is fine. You can do that, but he's running an illegal business that is not making money and is not paying its taxes his own claim and is bragging basically and making material about how you should feel good about stealing from the Nicaraguan economy and the Nicaraguan workers. That's not how I would describe all in on Nicaragua, unless you were talking about like organized crime being all in on Nicaragua. So from what we know, he was out of the country within a few weeks. So this video is one of the very last ones he made in Nicaragua. So his bragging about how this is his place, he immediately fled the country once uh, it came out what he did. And we don't know that that's why he fled the country, but it was within about 48 hours of the video coming out. So, and we know that the authorities do monitor these videos. So once it was obvious, it would be the thing to do, make a run for the border before you can't make a run for the border. Uh, but. This, this is an important juxtaposition that he's making these like, I'm all in on this, literally while he was packing his bags to run away. Now, one thing he mentions, and this is really important, right, is that he mentions that there's a cultural difference between what he's used to in North America and what he gets here in Nicaragua, and that is, and he uses this term marshmallow test, which I think really just that thought process around it shows how little he understands what it is he's talking about. But so the, the concept is um, you have a child comes up to you and you offer them a marshmallow and you say, well, if you wait 10 minutes, you can have two marshmallows. How many people are going to wait and get the bigger payoff? Well, that's a pretty dumb thing just in general, right? Now I understand it's just an example, but when you think about examples like this, it often helps you understand why the example doesn't make sense. And I don't just mean the picking of a marshmallow, I mean the general concept. So if you're going to get a marshmallow now or two in 10 minutes, you have a couple things to think about. One, do you even want a marshmallow? I don't, most people don't, but if you really like marshmallows, okay. If you really do like marshmallows, how many do you want? For most people, one is plenty. It's just a marshmallow. I've never really met too many people, a few for sure, that want multiple marshmallows. So waiting 10 minutes, just standing around for 10 minutes to get a second marshmallow is a pretty awful payoff since you might throw it out anyway. For me, I don't want either marshmallow. I just want to walk away. So Whatever his example of there's this, you know, he tries to make it sound like waiting for two marshmallows is good, taking the one is bad. Well, what if you want zero? How horrible must that be that I don't like marshmallows and is they're just not good for you, right? Now I understand it's just an example, but the point is, is that it's being used and we're gonna get into how he misuses it because he doesn't understand the marshmallows. And uh, so there's a lot of things to this, right? Is a marshmallow, even if you want a second marshmallow, the first one is basically free. Here's a marshmallow, wow. No overhead, do I want a marshmallow? That's an easy yes. If you like marshmallows, done. But waiting 10 minutes, 10 minutes is actually a really long time to wait for a marshmallow. You could go out and work for 10 minutes and earn a thousand marshmallows, like literally. So that's not a good payoff. That would be insane for someone to wait 10 minutes for a marshmallow unless they were completely unemployable and totally addicted to marshmallows. So it really shows that the, the concept of the marshmallow test means that anyone who would apply it doesn't understand 
business and people and money, right? Value. But I understand that the concept is, will people invest for the future so they can get more? That's what they want you to think about. And that's a valuable thing to approach. And we do talk about how what we consider a hustle culture in North America basically doesn't exist in Nicaragua. People are not going to go out and put in a lot of effort uh, to getting their businesses promoted or to their finding a new job. If it falls into their lap, great. If you hire someone, great. But if it's, oh, I have this business and all I have to do is put up a banner and get more people to come and, and shop. Nope, I'm not putting up a banner. Well, what about advertising on the radio? Nope, not going to do it. What about putting like your open hours on Facebook just so people can find you? Absolutely not. Your address? Are you crazy? Right, so there's this culture of I'm not willing to take what we consider just basic steps in North America. That's real. Um, and of course, there's exceptions, but there are so many businesses that refuse to give you their address, refuse to pin drop if you ask them, refuse to put their hours anywhere, refuse to have a website, refuse to have an email, just on and on. And you're like, how do I do business with you? And they're like, you figure it out. It is up to you. I am not going to make this easy for you. And Americans would be like, of course, we're going to do everything we can to make this easy for you. We're going to make the friction so low that you can't help but do business with us. Right? That's our mentality. Here it's, if you want to do business with me, you'll find me, which is not true. I know Nicaraguans who can't find on a regular basis businesses they want to do business with and just give up because they feel powerless. They're impotent to find the business and they know no matter how much they ask, they're never going to be led to them. Now, probably that's because the people working there aren't the owners and they have zero interest in having more work show up because they're not compensated extra for that. So why would they tell you, right? I can only imagine that's what's driving it. But I've talked to investors who've talked to business owners here and the actual owners are like, why would I advertise my business? I have just enough work that I'm still in business and I don't make enough to really survive, but that's okay. And you're like, but you could easily make so much more. And he's like, but that would take effort. And because that effort doesn't pay by the hour, uh, it feels like something they shouldn't do. The idea that you would do work that's only for the hope of more work in the future doesn't like click with a lot of people. So that's, that is a cultural difference. And in some ways, this is kind of what he's alluding to. But when he then gives a real concrete example, which is his own employees and people that he wants to work with, basically what he was doing, we know about this, is that instead of offering to just pay them a salary where they're earning what their work is worth, they're trying to do what's basically a bonus system, right? Now they do this in like Wall Street and especially in California, when they look to screw over um, less competent staff, they say, oh, we're a startup, we're going to make all this money in the future. So instead of paying you what you're worth, we're going to pay you a lot less, but enough to live in theory. Um, but we're going to give you all these stock options. So when we do well, you're going to be just rich as can be. And it's really hard to turn that down because it sounds so good and they're offering you a job. But 99% of the time, that doesn't come to fruition. Either it's stock options that never mature, or in many cases, it's the promise of a bonus that then they come up with an excuse as to why they're not going to pay the bonus. And then you're left with nothing. And so if that's how it is in the United States, and it's just expected, if you say the word bonus in the United States, or you say the word stock options in the United States, it's assumed that they don't have faith in their own business. And they're trying to find a way to mitigate the risk that they have assessed. Because if the owners of the business had faith in their product and business model, the last thing they would want to do is those things. They don't want to give you a big payoff if things go well. They assume things are going to go well. They want to pay you what's fair now so that you're not looking for a big payoff. They get the big payoff, right? They're not going to trade that in if they have faith. That's when you know that the owners of the business have given up. They're like, okay, it's not worth folding the company, but it's also not something we believe in. So that's where he's been, right? He knows the business doesn't make any sense. Obviously he does. There's no way he's lived in Nicaragua for four years or even four days and thinks the numbers he's working with are real, that the needs he claims are needed are real. Like clearly if he's in Nicaragua, he knows this. So when he's going to these employees and being like, oh, I have this business plan, you could get a percentage of it in exchange for barely making any money, obviously they're going to say no. This is not them not, you know, thinking through what's the bigger payoff. This is exactly them thinking through what's the bigger payoff. And right weeks after this video was made, his company vanished and they're not available in the country. All those workers are out of work. Any bonuses are zero. Any, you know, uh, ownership is zero. It is gone. So that's a really important thing that they understood what investment means and that this was a bad one or not even a real one. And so when he's saying like, ah, oh, Nicaraguans, they don't, they don't think about the big payoff. No, you just gave an example of exactly how they do think about the big payoff and they knew you weren't offering them one. That's really important. So 
Yes, Nicaraguans are more likely to take the bird in the hand. That is kind of true. And hustle isn't a thing that's generally found across the population. It's just there's a hustle to the North American culture that's kind of unique to it. Uh, and, and it doesn't replicate here. But that's more that we in North America are unique than Nicaraguans are lacking that. Uh, but it does catch people by surprise, often coming from North America. And you're like, why don't you take advantage of this opportunity? And they're like, it doesn't seem like an opportunity. And it's just different ways of viewing things. But that is not what's happening here. Okay, Tony mentions border runs and that he once went over by 400 days and had to pay $3 per day penalty for that. Uh, yeah, that's normal. And you're generally not going to get in a lot of trouble for that. The $1,200 could be considered a lot of trouble, but you know, it is what it is. $3 a day really isn't that bad. What's important, he completely leaves this out because he's like, yeah, it doesn't seem like too bad of a deal. I've been late a few times, like no big deal. It's not a huge deal, but be aware that every time you are late, that can be a strike against you. It definitely goes on your record. Now, every time you go out and back in, if your record is clean, you generally have no problem whatsoever. Even people with a lot of little problems generally come in without a problem until they're too many times and eventually they get flagged and, and need to have residency and then it's a conversation. It's not a big deal. If you have these late on there, yeah, you miss one day over a couple years, chances are no one's going to mention it ever. But if you have multiple times that you are late or giant ones like 400 days, these things are going to vary potentially, not 100% of the time, but they absolutely are considered when you're applying for residency later. So if you want to get that residency someday in the future, be sure not to just take this callously and be like, eh, no big deal. Now, I have residency. I had a, uh, a late time. It was about 30 days. Uh, it was my whole family, so that added up a little bit. But it was one time, and it was only about 30 days, and we called them, and we're like apologizing. We're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe we did this. Should we just come in? And they're like, yes, come in. And, and you know, we like really went out of our way. We didn't run to the border to pay it. We ran locally to pay it. We're like, we're so sorry. Um, but, you know, one time, only 30 days. And, and it didn't really come up, but we were told to be really careful careful because when they're considering residency, you know, you want to have your nose as clean as possible and not necessarily paying attention. They understand a lot of times this is just you didn't pay attention. Being 400 days means way over a year. Uh, that's a year and a month and extra that you were not paying attention. That's an awfully long time to forget four border runs. Um, so I don't know how they would treat that, but just be aware that when it comes to your residency, you don't want to have marks on your record. If you can help it, def definitely keep them minimal uh, as much as you can. Okay, a little bit further in, Tony gets into the big illegal thing that he got into in the last video and, and basically tells a little bit more of the story in a little bit different perspective. So I want to dig into this. I know we've dig, dug into this before, but it's a really important bit that he still, a month later, doesn't have a single clue as to what he's talking about. And he's giving this advice or repeating this information completely incorrectly. These are things that anyone who has a lawyer or an accountant or was looking at starting an essay, hiring an employee, all these things are day one things you have to know before you have an employee. How he got to day two without all of his people explaining how he has to pay people, what has to be done, I don't know. But I understand maybe he got taken advantage of. But at this point, he's like, I got a great lawyer, I got a great accountant, and then he describes them as completely screwing him over, and he doesn't even realize it. So this is a great example of why expats make really bad recommendations on things. He doesn't know that he's been getting screwed all this time and, and is completely oblivious to everything going on. So first of all, he keeps using the word cedula. So let's talk about what a cedula is, because this is a universal word. This is not a Nicaragua thing. This is a national ID card. Most of the world has cedulas. Now, most of the Spanish world calls them cedulas. Other people call them other things. But it's simply a national ID card. It's much like your driver's license in the United States, but it does not have to do anything with an individual state. It's national, because we're a small country, and it is not for driving. It's just your ID. So it's used for any time you need to do a bank transaction or anything. Instead of saying, hey, show your passport, or hey, show your driver's license, or hey, show your state ID, they say, show your cedula. That is a national ID. Very simple. Everyone should have one. Every single person except tourists. Only tourists don't have a cedula. So if you are uh, a resident, you have a cedula. If you are a citizen, you have a cedula. Period. That's it, right? Now, could someone have lost one? Could someone never have gotten it printed? Of course. But everyone has an ID number, like someone needs to go get a cedula sometimes. But he's talking about it in like a really weird way. Like if you have a cedula, there's like these things that happen. No, everyone is treated as if they have a cedula and you have to get their cedulas to employ them. Like this is just 
basics. So he's referring to it as if it's a payment system. It's, it's literally the physical plastic card. Um, so that's just weird confusion. Okay, so some of the other things he's talking about uh, is, one, he talks about what he owes, but he never explains why he owes it. So he says he owes one month's salary. Chances are that's because he hadn't paid the last month. I don't know that for sure, but that is almost certainly what it is. It was just that spot in his cycle where he was owed, he owed the last month. Okay, then he had to pay the, he mentions it as this extra month. That is not an extra month. That is, he didn't do his accounting correctly. Either he or his accountant screwed up or both, and they didn't realize that he had missed a payment. So he owed another payment. He was basically one day short. Of, we don't know exactly the days, but he was effectively one day short of owing another payment. So this is going to happen whether he fired the guy or not. This is just you know, he didn't understand uh, how salaries work. He didn't understand that you have to pay all of the, the pay periods, not just all but one of them, right? He was thinking he didn't have to pay the last pay period. Imagine that in the United States. Oh, it's Christmas. I'm ready for my Christmas, you know, month month uh, salary so that I can, you know, have dinner with my family for Christmas. And then you find out your employer is like, pay you for December? Heck no, right? Now here it's slightly different. Pay you for the last four weeks of December? Heck no, right? But that's what it is. It's the last 28 days of December. He was not going to pay that guy for that time. Presumably he worked until about that, that time. This is the 24th or what? I'm not sure exactly when it happened, but I think it was a year before. So that is why there were those two salary numbers. One is his uh, mid-November to first week of December, and his last one was the last bit of December. Because here, everyone's on the same cycle. There aren't, like, companies don't have their own cycles. Everyone is on the same day or really close. That's the first part. Then the other thing that he mentions, and I think this is what he's referring to as a sedula. I mean, and really, sedula is the kind of thing you should know in your first two, three weeks living in Nicaragua, because everyone's going to talk about it. Every time you go to a bank, they're like, hey, can we see your sedula? Every time you go to get a car, can I see your sedula? Every time you get stopped by the police, can I see your sedula? Right? And if you don't have one, you have to say, ah, I don't have a sedula. I have a driver's license. I have a passport. And then they go, oh, okay. Right? That's all there is. If you go to the sh corner shop and you need to drop someone 20 bucks, you need to show your sedula or your passport. Right? This really isn't weird. This is normal everyday life in Nicaragua stuff. So not, you know, as an investor, supposedly, who's doing all this business, it's really weird that he doesn't have the casual, I went to the corner store kind of knowledge in the first weeks when he claims to have been there for four years. But okay. So the thing he's talking about with when an employee leaves is that it's, this is called the liquidation and it's essentially a severance, but it's not a severance based on, um, we have to pay them because we've separated. It is while they work for you, they earn this money. You have to have Two, set this aside and have it for them. You can do this any way you want. As long as you can pay it, you may do it any way you want, right? It can be, I have personal money. I don't think anyone's going to quit. If the company doesn't have funds, I loan the company my own money. Cool, that's fine. No one's complaining about that. As long as they get their money within the 10 days, all is well, okay? So liquidation is something that every time you have an employee, you have to calculate every day they work. Every single day, their liquidation goes up. Now, it's not very big, right? You're talking about an employee that makes $300 a month, like he describes here. You need to have, I don't know, something like $20 a month set aside for their liquidation. I don't know the exact number. It's not huge, but it is noticeable when it adds up over time. What most companies tend to do is completely ignore it and panic when it comes time to pay people, even though those people have already earn that salary. This is a really stupid way to run a business, right? Your accountant should be telling you, hey, let's set this money aside from day one and have enough for at least 50% of our staff to walk out or better yet, every single person. It's their money. They've already earned it. If they work for one day and quit, you still have to pay it. It'll be a penny, but you'll still have to pay it. So you have to have that money set aside. You can't have the attitude of, I'll earn it later. That's not allowed. You have to have this money at the time. They can always claim it. Now, the thing that he says, is, I had to fire all my employees. That makes absolutely no sense. That's crazy talk. An option that you have here is you are allowed to fire employees and immediately rehire them, right? Same day you say, hey, look, we're going to do a fire hire thing. And they say, okay, when you do that, you have to pay their liquidation. And then they can start working again. So let's say someone works for you for a year and they save up, I don't know, $100 liquidation, $200. I have no idea. 
you set that money aside for the year. And at the end of the year, you say, okay, it's Christmas. We're going to fire you. We're going to give you your liquidation for that. We're going to rehire you and you can start at zero and earn up again. It doesn't change how much money they get. It just changes that they get it a little bit at a time. So you could do this every month. You could do this every year. You could do it every decade, or you could just hold the money in an account somewhere and over time, uh, you know, be prepared to pay it out. Now, what com larger companies tend to do is not keep it all in cash. They keep it invested with just enough in cash to cover a couple of employees. And that way they're earning money on it and they're not attritioning out. The employee will attrition. They will lose money based on inflation. So the money they earn early gets less and less over time. So if you hold cash and nothing but cash over a long period of time, everyone just kind of loses. But if you put it into an investment account or do something with it with most of it, as long as you have enough liquidity to be able to cover those things, then uh, if someone quits, you're able to, to get that. And the amount that you actually have to pay them is actually less in real value. So there's smart ways to do this, but you got to keep that money liquid within 10 days, right? So it's not a, this is not onerous at all. And these are just basic things you have to know. There's no reasonable way that he, his lawyer, and his accountant didn't all know this. Every employee in Nicaragua knows this. Now, at the end of all this, what he did was he went with his lawyer and went to this guy and said, we can't pay you. So we're going to get you to sign this contract that we're going to pay you late. Well, you're not allowed to ask that. So asking that, this is where you, this is the second time, third time that we know his lawyer's a crook and, and screwing him, right? Obviously, you can't just ask that. You're saying, I'm not going to give you what I owe you. But if you wait this long, I promise to do it later, right? Well, you already owe it. So making him sign that document is duress because you're threatening not to give him what you owe him. Why would he sign that? He would never sign that unless he felt threatened. So you're not allowed to do that. Now, if you went to him and you said, I'm going to pay you half now and an extra 200, like I'm going to give you half. This is what I have. And in 60 days, I'm going to give you the rest plus extra. Then you could negotiate and have some ground to stand on when you get to the court and you say, look, I, I, I couldn't pay him, but I'm trying to give him more. I'm trying to entice him to accept the longer time period. He wins and we're able to make our payment. And you still might lose because you owe the money, period. Why don't you have it? You stole from him. Now, yeah, you may not have stolen his money, but you stole the liquidity that you owe him already. You don't owe him new. You've owed him this all along. So that whole idea that you're going to get him to sign something that's going to be late and you didn't give him a, there's, there was no give and take, right? This is a contract where you simply said, I'm not going to meet my obligations, sign this or what the court has to assume, or I'm not going to pay you at all. I'm literally threatening to steal from you. You lose. I'm going to take from you in time, or I'm going to take from you in money. Take your pick, right? And you don't have the right to do that. So you have to come up with a compromise. You didn't, he didn't do this in this scenario. So of course the, the guy took him to court because what else would he do? He has no ability to empathize or think as an employee or think logically or just, I mean, such common sense. You cannot go to someone you owe something to and be like, I'm not going to pay you, <laughs> right? That's going to go badly. And when it's an employee and you're a foreigner with loads of money, he has access, he has all this rich stuff, right? He's got iPads, he's got a Hilux, he's bragging about how much money he spends on everything, how he can just throw money away everywhere, how he can have a building company and all this stuff. He's literally online constantly bragging about all the money he's making. So this isn't hard or challenging at all. This is incredibly basic. It is simply that you have some basic requirements as an employer. You don't have to pay medical. I don't know what he's going on about with that. You just have to pay the normal income taxes called INS. There's none of these complicated things. You just simply have to pay their salary. And just because they quit doesn't mean you don't have to pay the salary for what they've already worked. And you have to pay all of their salary. You can't just randomly skip payments. And when they earn liquidation, which is basically a severance, it is earned. You can't just treat it as a bonus or something like that and only pay it when you feel like it's their money that you are required to hold on their behalf until such time as they separate from you. So yes, you can fire people to, to pay that out so you don't have to do that accounting. That would be really foolish because it leaves you with less financial resources to make money. But if you have really, really bad accounting and just no way to get a handle on your lawyers and accountants and you can't do math at all, then yes, if you pay them out every year, it keeps you from having to maintain books and do basic accounting and keep money set aside for something. But I don't know how you function as a business in any sense, if that's something you have any challenge with whatsoever. But that would explain why we don't have Radpad in Nicaragua now. 
This is pretty basic accounting stuff. Investor residency just isn't that common. Even with the stuff he's doing, unless he has a functional business, functional employees, really paying taxes, all those things, he's not gonna qualify. It's not just that you decide to put in some money. You gotta actually be doing stuff and doing it properly. And the kinds of things he brags about in this video and the last, these are things that guarantee you're not eligible until you get that completely cleaned up. And those are gonna be marks against you much bigger than your border run problem marks against you that you're gonna have to overcome if you want to get the permission to get that residency. Now, maybe he can still get a simpler residency, but the investor one is going to be very stringent and they test a lot of things. You have to have your type of business improve, approved. They have to inspect it. They have to make sure that your business location is functional, that the employees are being treated a certain way. There's a, and they interview employees. Like it's a big process that there's no way he was going to pass. So he mentions this as if it's part of his experience, but that's not plausible. And that he disappeared from the country within a few weeks just, you know, suggest that as well. Okay, so after this point, so we're up at about 30 minutes in, he then goes down again because Joe Hudson said, I noticed that the, oh, I'm sorry. He says, thanks for sharing. I have to work really hard to read what this says. Uh, sounds like there are many benefits for the employees versus the employer. No, this is completely false. This is just Tony getting all the information wrong and trying to make himself look good. Yes, there are some good protections for the employees, but those protections are you have to pay them the salaries they've earned. That's it. That is not protecting the employees over the employers. If you have any hedging on that, like in the U.S., that's pure corruption. That only happens when completely disgusting politicians are willing to burn the citizens of the country in order to make a little bit of money from an employer who's willing to pass some cash to make them do something unthinkably unethical. There is no situation where an employee earning a salary and then getting fired or deciding to move on to another job gets a, oh, sorry, we're not going to pay you because we never had the money in at all. We made you take on the risk as the employee, but all the reward is the owner. That is absolutely disgusting. And no, this, this attitude of Nicaragua is, is favoring employees is BS. That is not what's going on, but Tony's working really hard to sell this in a really disgusting manner. Everything he's saying here is gross and horrible. And I, I, sorry, it is. These are really terrible things that he's saying. And one of them right after, in response to Joe's question, Tony has these words that he's worked up to be ready and this example that's wrong to try to make it sound like he's the victim when he stole from people, when he was robbing people, when he was taking advantage of really poor people in a terrible, terrible way. He was hiring employees without the money to pay them and he didn't have a plan to pay them, right? So this employee quit. He did, there's no bonus. Nowhere in the system is there a bonus. If he says the word bonus, he is being completely deceptive. He's deceiving you, trying to make it feel like there's this bonus, but it was his salary. You get 13 salary payments per year in Nicaragua, period, end of story. Had the guy not quit, he still would have owed that thing that he's calling a bonus because it's just his salary. And in fact, he already owed it and he was just about to be late because he didn't plan ahead for paying the salary of his employees. He had stolen that money by spending it on iPads and stuff. And he tries to act like the equipment that he buys for work, right? Like I have employees, buy them a laptop, maybe I get them a car, whatever. Do I buy them those things? No, they're, they're company equipment. They don't want to use an iPad. They don't want to drive the car. They just want to get paid for doing their job. That stuff is the company's and it's part of doing their job. That is not a bonus for them. That is not a gift to them. That is not some kind of being nice to them at all. But he's trying to make it sound like basic providing the tools for doing their job is somehow doing them a favor. And then he points out without actually saying it that his employees in theory, if this really happened, gained skills and he decided not to compensate them for it. So they became more skilled and then someone decided to pay them commensurate with their skills and experience when he wasn't willing or, as he pointed out, able to. So he wanted a skill set that was not available on at the price point that he was still unable to pay, right? Let's keep in mind, whoever this he's talking about, he says left to make more money because they were worth it somewhere else and he wasn't even able to pay them the salary they had already earned at a lower rate for him. So this is layers of taking advantage of this person. Now, of course, you say, look, I've given you a job for a while. I'm willing to pay you this. You know, I'm willing to take my chances and you can move on if you want. Absolutely. That's nothing wrong with that, right? Like that's, that's okay, more or less. But 
in this case, it put Tony at risk because of course the people are able to move on, but there's no bonus. He simply found out through this process that he had gotten behind on making the salary payments and had not been saving up the liquidation. So these employees are not getting a bonus for moving to another job. They are not getting all they're doing is trying to get the money that he already owed them. And at this moment, it triggers and a investigation into why he can't pay within 10 days. That's the only thing that happened, is a discovery of RadPad not being liquid. So it's a completely different thing than the employees taking advantage of him. None of that happened. None of this was someone favoring the employees. This was just him being whiny because he was suddenly exposed for not having paid and not being prepared to pay what the employees had already earned. Okay, so after this, right, Tony goes into, so what we learned, right, and this whole video seems to be centering around after four years, he hasn't learned anything, uh, is that he said, well, what they learned is that they moved everyone to contract. Okay, so first of all, if you're going to do contract workers in Nicaragua, this is really complicated, and there's potentially a lot of pitfalls. You want to be super careful with this, and it can cause problems with getting medical care, and it can cause blowback on you. You need to have lawyers you can trust, and if you ever were in a situation, for example, where your lawyer didn't know about how to pay the 13th month, uh, the liquidations, your accountant didn't hold that money back, you certainly can't go to contract, because neither you nor your team are mentally prepared to, to discuss it. You don't know enough about the universe to make these kinds of decisions. Contractors are difficult employees or easy because they work for you, you own their time. So you say, oh, I want you to do this, this task or that task, and they can do whatever it is you need. Uh, and um, it's flexible. You don't have to put in a whole bunch of overhead to figuring out how to describe what they're going to do. Like it's just, there's a reason why everybody with any brain uses employees except for very special cases. So if you owned a business, let's say you had 10 employees and they did all the normal stuff and every so often you needed this one special task. It was part time. It was a specialty skill. You don't want to have an employee for that. That's where having a contractor generally, both in the US, Canada, uh, Nicaragua, doesn't matter. This is just basic business common sense. That's where contractors generally work out the best. Uh, it, replacing employees with contractors makes basically no sense ever. And Tony explains why. He describes how everything he's doing is wrong and describes why RadPad is bound to fail all through this little bit of discussion. And that is that he decided that moving to contract without any explanation as to why, he never gave a reason as to why it's positive. Uh, he gave a lot of words, but none of them actually as a business were positive. They were all, ooh, that's not good. Ooh, that's not good. Less flexibility, more money. So the good thing is in theory, the employees made more money. I don't believe that that actually happened. How did he come up with the money to do that? He just said how he didn't have money to pay the salaries for the people he already had. But okay, somehow they have enough money to pay these contractors. So they pay these contractors and he says they're now paying them more. More money is going out the door. Okay, from a business perspective, this isn't hard. Businesses like to earn more, pay less. Those are the only things you really need to worry about. The entire world of business comes down to those two things. Raising how much money you bring in and lowering how much money goes out. That's it. Everything else is just processes to make those two things happen. And you can do either one. Well, we raise the amount that we're paying, but it's because we really raise the amount we're bringing in. That's fine, right? As long as your profits at the end of the day, which is calculated from these two things together, is better. So basic, basic business here, he says they failed because what they did was out of an emotional reaction of being angry at workers because he was cheating them and because his team was cheating him and he didn't figure it out, his response was to act like somehow he was taking advantage of the workers by paying them more. Well, that's the end result. If that's true is great. They're making more money, but are they really, I don't know if he can really calculate that, if he doesn't know these other things, how can he determine that, right? Clearly his accountant can't add, so that's not something you can trust him to give us information on. But we're talking about more money being spent for the same tasks to be done. Why was he angry about paying the salaries and paying the liquidation if he's not angry about paying more? I understand that the liquidation process is confusing if you don't have any common sense at all. And I understand that paying 13 times a year instead of 12 might catch you off guard the first time if you don't really dig into it and have no knowledge of Latin America whatsoever and it's your first day and, and you just didn't do any research. But it works that way everywhere from Mexico to Buenos uh, to, to Argentina. It is universal throughout much of the world because it's simpler for a lot of things and there are parts of the US that do that as well. I grew up, my father was paid on the uh, lunar monthly calendar as it's known. 
down every four weeks instead of 12 times a year. It's more even, it works out better for everybody if you have the slightest ability to do math. So it's, it's a great system and I'm glad that they do it, but I can see why maybe you'd be caught off guard because you just have no knowledge of business or the world. Okay, but once you learn that, it's super simple and you simply look at the numbers and go, oh, one way I can make more money and one way I can make less money. Why is he bragging about and recommending that people make less money. That's literally what he's saying. We had a system that was better. We were doing the right thing other than not having enough money to pay our, our debts. But now we're going to owe more money and that, and that he's happy about that. At no point does he explain why losing money is a good thing when the entire problem is he didn't have enough money. Okay, around 35 minutes, 35 and a half, he says that Nicaragua is so affordable, it solves your financial problems, which is true, so great, but he started the video complaining that Nicaragua wasn't cheap and cost as much as the most expensive countries on the two continent region. So that's a weird leap of context. Like I can't tell what he's trying to say or why, um, it's just throwing things at the wall, I guess, at this point. I just, I just want to point out that at about 38 minutes, he says that as the CEO of a giant juice company, he made $10,000 per month Canadian. I, I haven't worked in the Canadian juice industry in a while, but that doesn't sound like a reasonable number for the line supervisors of a giant juice company in Canada. Okay, the part where he claims that he has no idea what the English word vegetarian is, is a little bit weird, but okay. Now he makes a point about, you know, if you're gonna be buying packaged food, that's gonna give you a different experience in Nicaragua than it is somewhere else. And it's it, a lot of us who are talking about Nicaragua, we're not talking about eating a lot of packaged food. We reduce that. We still eat some, of course, but we don't eat as much. But he gives some misleading information here. He kind of alludes to the correct answer, but he doesn't really dig into it. He leaves you wondering about something kind of critical. So when you're going to any store anywhere in the world, like this is not anything to do with Nicaragua. This is just basic traveler stuff. If you're going to be living somewhere other than your home country, the products that you're used to in your home country are not gonna be the same products you eat where you move to. It's super expensive to import the local foods, especially from a place to somewhere else because they don't travel very well in most cases. It's rare to have food that travels really, really well and most of the logistics coming into Nicaragua, especially is by container ship or overland truck. We don't have fast trains. We're not flying food in on airplanes. It doesn't make sense. So if you wanna bring something in from the United States, as an example, it's got a be purchased in the United States at normal prices and then shipped a really long way. So can we get a lot of those things? Yeah, of course we can. Do you normally want to get them? No, they don't make sense because that's not the food from here and they're super expensive because you're specifically buying the brands that don't come from here. Like, I get it. Like, it's, if it's your first time ever living anywhere, these things just completely catch you by surprise and you don't know what to do. But, and he's right. Moving away from packaged food, you're gonna be healthier and you're gonna save money, right? Eating a banana is gonna be cheaper and healthier than getting, you know, anything that's prepackaged. So, yes. But there is loads and loads of local packaged food as well. You go to La Colonia and the majority of those products are not from the United States. The mac and cheese, the best mac and cheese. So first of all, you never get American mac and cheese in Nicaragua. Why? In the United States, they dry ship all the mac and cheese in cardboard. They don't seal it. So when it goes the really long container ships and stuff into Nicaragua or anywhere else in the world, they're full of bugs because the United States does not seal their stuff from bugs. They have lower health standards than most of the world, certainly lower than Nicaragua or Europe. So while they still allow Americans to sell it in Nicaragua, Nicaraguans won't make that themselves. So you want to get the cheaper, much higher quality Nicaraguan mac and cheese that's sealed in plastic and not full of bugs. It's kind of a win-win-win. Made locally, cheaper, tastes better, like no bugs. Why would you want the buggy stuff? He's specifically mentioning getting the American ones that even at Price Mart are full of bugs because they don't put, they're, they're not sealed at all. A bug just crawls right in. You don't think about it until you look at the boxes and realize these are wide open. So they, all the time, full of bugs. So, but everything, whether it's cereal or, or candy bars or 
everything has a local equivalent. Now, some things are difficult to get good locally. Candy bars are one of them, but we get good prices on European candy, which is generally better than North American candy anyway. And we're all going to pay more as a premium for all of those because they're shipped in from really far away. So candy bars tend to be expensive. That's kind of a unique thing. But everything else, we have really good local cereal. It's cheaper than in the U.S. for sure. We have really good uh, local, you know, mac and cheese, better than in the U.S., cheaper than in the U.S., for sure. Ice cream, same thing. All these packaged food, if you want to stick with packaged food, you're still going to be eating cheaper than you would in the U.S. or Canada. So don't, don't take this as a all packaged food is super expensive. When he's trying to, or anyone, is trying to artificially inflate how expensive Nicaragua is, they do so by trying to do something you would never compare. If you went to the United States and asked how expensive is it, and you only compared the products that are local to Nicaragua, well, I'm only going to eat Ranchitos brand chips, because they're the best. I'm only going to eat the Nicaraguan brand cereal. I'm only going to eat the Roma brand, which is Nicaragua brand uh, mac and cheese. Well, guess what? In the United States, those things are going to be four, five, six times as expensive as they are in Nicaragua. So if you treated both as, as apples to apples instead of apples to oranges, you would quickly see that, oh, yes, it is cheaper in Nicaragua. You're just doing a false comparison to try to, you know, smoke and mirrors, make people not notice that you're comparing local food in one place to imported food in the other. But if you do local to local or imported to imported, then Nicaragua is going to win by a landslide in, in cost. All right, at 44 minutes, I don't, I didn't see it happen, but he must have slipped himself shrooms at some point because this part just goes haywire. And he starts talking about residence frequencies and houses being connected with nature. And he's trying to say that there's a problem with Nicaraguan houses because you like close the doors and have walls. Uh, it's super weird, as if in the U.S. and Canada, we don't have walls and doors. Um, it's super strange. And he's all talking about how you're fighting nature and you're trying to keep the sun out, right? Because it's really hot. And you're trying to cool down, right? Because it's like really hot. And you want it quiet, right? So I can be on the phone or do my job or just not listen to my neighbors talking all the time, which is a regular complaint that I have that I can't get thick enough walls to not constantly listen to the people outside my window screaming and pe play people playing music next door. Like it, it does wear on you. That's one of my biggest complaints in Nicaragua is the never ending noise and how important it is to have some means of shutting it out. And when we lived in the middle of the city, we couldn't. And, and it started to drive me mad. And, and living in the country, it's still a lot, but it's way, way better. He's basically saying the, uh, I mean, everyone has their own opinion, but he's really going in that you should just be outdoors all day long. Like houses should just be roofs with no walls. Like, yeah, I don't think he's saying it should rain on you, but he's like, you need to be connected to nature. But then his reason for this is because in the evening you need to be able to run air conditioning. I don't know how you get much more disconnected from nature than going into your house at night, closing everything up and running air conditioning instead of having fresh air. I'm not saying we don't do that. I'm just saying that his whole logic as to why you need to connect to nature is so that you can disconnect from nature as well. So his theory didn't hold up. Of course, he was trying to come up with a lead-in to sell Radpad, which doesn't have real walls and doesn't make any sense. So it's nonsensical. So so is he. But he's going into some really seriously weird stuff here. Like, seriously, you should watch it at 44 minutes and listen to him talking about sound resonances and how Nicaraguan houses are no good because they don't resonate properly. Uh-huh. And, but, but there's some really important things here. Like one of the reasons, and then he tries to say that the reason that Nicaraguans build with concrete is because they're trying to make it quiet so they can be force fed advertising from television. Now, I don't know very many Nicaraguans who watch television at all, let alone go home and spend their time doing that. Like that's not a super normal thing. Obviously some do, right? People have televisions. I don't personally know anyone who does that as a Nicaraguan though. Oops, sorry. Bump my microphone. Like that is really outside the culture. And, uh, and those that do do that are typically watching Netflix and YouTube, not television with ads, but okay. So his theory is that houses are designed to make it easy to hear advertising so that you can be spoon fed what big companies want you to hear. Now, who exactly decided to build houses in order to make it easier for advertisers? That doesn't make a whole lot of sense when you think about how houses get built in Nicaragua. People just build them themselves. So you're building yourself a house and you stop and you go, you know what? If I put in really nice thick walls that help keep the sun out and keep me cool and keep me safe and don't fall apart from termites or salt damage and are really cost effective and will last so I can give it to my children and their children and their children instead of having it all rot away and fall 
down. Uh, I know that it's good for all those reasons, but I wouldn't do that. I would make it really foolish without walls and just live in a shed if it wasn't for the fact that I want to be listening to commercials. And so they spend all this money so that they can listen to commercials? That's actually what he's saying? Shrooms. It's the only explanation. How his addled brain could come up with something so wild is just crazy. And let's not forget, he's talking about a building style that has been in place for 500 years in this country alone and has a history before that. 500 years ago, he's saying that they built thick walls because someday they'd have televisions and that 500 years ago they were prioritizing that over keeping the house cool when it's really hot here all the time? It seems a bit of a stretch, even for mushrooms. I was warned very strongly that I could not appear in video with him because it would put my ability to get residency or whatever in jeopardy because you, you don't want to associate or appear to be associating with someone who has not just committed crimes or believed to commit crimes, but is well known as a con artist and that, you know, really had become a brand name even a couple years ago in the country uh, of the scams in San Juan del Sur. Something that is always a concern here, that there's so much of it that it really does hurt the reputation of the country because of stuff like this. So that was something, as the reason that we never did um, anything together, I knew that I couldn't. Uh, but at the end really is just this crazy sales pitch and he's no longer here in Nicaragua. So I, I think that frames nicely what you see in this video. And I'm sorry that I waited so long to go back and look at this. Um, I needed the time to knock out a video today and this was kind of perfect. And I hope this format was interesting. I know I, I'm pretty angry, but this is someone who's hurt a lot of people. And yes, a lot of expats have been taken advantage of and a lot of money has been lost. But as we often say, that's caveat emptor. There's no way anyone did business with him and wasn't aware that nothing he said made sense and that he didn't have the slightest clue of, of accounting or business or opportunity or Nicaragua or building. Someone with one week in Nicaragua should have had deep insight that what he was saying made no sense. The prices didn't make any any sense. His proposition didn't make any sense. Glass houses don't make any sense. All those things. And, and, and the whole like he, and then this is a great example. One, like I said, of someone who came here and never learned anything about Nicaragua on one hand. Like this is a staggering degree of not having learned the basics about the place they lived in four years and doesn't know these things. But then also a really great example of the, the gringo coming in and having this, I know better than 500 years of Nicaraguan know-how in building materials and processes and what makes sense and what's affordable and what lasts and, and what stays cool and, and why you do things. And he's doing that. I'm, I'm from North America, so I know better. I have all this knowledge. Well, trust me, everyone here knows how to use galvanized metal. Everyone here knows about modular homes. Everyone here knows about using glass. And they don't because it didn't make sense. And they also know what houses cost here. So they're doing mathematical equations that are clearly beyond him and his lawyer and his accountant who don't even know how to simply use a savings account or to have a bucket within their pool of money to set aside for something that they owe. So that just normal people know better is something that he's oblivious to, but he's, you know, kind of paved the road for us to be like, oh yes, this is the danger in coming into any new place from any old place and feeling like we as the new people have this ability to fix everyone's problems. First, he hasn't identified actual problems. This is a really common thing when I see anything like this here in Nicaragua. The, the North Americans who come in are like, I'm going to fix this thing. It's just like with the Bitcoins. People are like, there's this problem. They're like, That's not a problem here. Have you spent five minutes in Nicaragua? We don't have that problem that you're claiming. And then they say, I can fix it with, you name the solution. You say, you can't fix something that isn't a problem and that thing will introduce the problem that you're claiming to fix. Have you not thought through this at all? The answer is no, because the whole point is to sell foolish people on investing, not to sell a product because no one's going to fall for that. It's so easy. Oh, $100,000 for something I can buy locally made that makes sense today? $25,000, $30,000? Why would I spend three times as much? You wouldn't, and they don't. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to help support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash scottallenmiller. You can subscribe to the channel with the join button down below. And as always, I will see all of you tomorrow.